So what are the different uh, procurement models? Uh, there's, there's four, uh, probably three of which are, are more relevant. You've got a traditional lump sum tender. Not much of this is happening at the moment in the industry. Um, design and construct is the default position. Majority of projects that are procured and tenders have gone down a DNC process. A build the transfer model, um, not very common, but does exist in small, small areas. And then you've got your early contractor involvement. I very much want to compare these two. So compare the default option of a DNC and compare that to what we believe is the most efficient and um, uh, collaborative way of procuring a, a project is through the, uh, the ECI process or early contractor involvement. So let's focus on the, on the current default setting. Um, I've tried to summarise it pretty simply in, in, a, in a table, as you can see, just, just quickly working through each of these stages and I'll hone in on each of the, the critical ones. A developer purchases a development site, a developer appoints an architect, architect develops town planning documents. Town planning documents are lodged, town planning documents are approved. Now, I'm sure that stage takes a bit longer, probably ends up at VCAT and bit of argument, bit of argy-bargy, but eventually they get approved. Developer then appoints the project manager, um, sometimes, um, or they run it themselves, as well as other consultants. Design development and tenor document process um, commences, and the percentage at which they take design development varies. Um, depending on how much the developer wants to have say in the design, generally the percentage is higher, but a lot of the time we find it sits between 60 to 80 per cent. Then it goes out the builder tender, they try to find four to five, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes three. But on average, let's assume it's four to five builders. That gets tendered over a four to six week period. Uh, the builders then submit their tender packages. Tender, rev tender packages are reviewed during a period of time. Builder is appointed. And then the critical part here is the consultants are then novated to the builder. And the builder takes responsibility for the delivery of the design. And then construction commences. Again, that end bit takes a bit longer than I've just said it, but gives you, gives you an idea. So let's hone into each item. So firstly, I want to talk about the architects uh, develops the town planning documents. Now during this phase, um, the really key component here is really try to develop an efficient design that aligns with the development budget. Surprisingly, um, a lot of the time this doesn't happen. Um, and the question is asked, how are construction costs compared to the actual development budget during that phase? Now, how many architects have you got in the room? Okay, I'll tread lightly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, if, if an architect is given the sole responsibility of designing a building to a budget, um, I believe that's very difficult, especially in the space we live in at the moment in the construction industry, with prices escalating, resources being an issue. Quantity surveyors are struggling at the moment to really hone in on how much buildings cost. And we're finding them overcorrecting, undercorrecting, and trying to find this space. So if a, if a quantity surveyor is struggling to find out or work out how much a building costs in the real world, how is an architect supposed to do that? Okay, so it's a really important point. And it's, and it's, and it's the first opportunity the builder has to actually, as a consultant, contribute some value to the process. Okay, the builders are the best people to tell you how much stuff costs when it, when it talks about building. All right, so getting a builder involved in this point is, is really, really critical and doesn't happen very often. And the other side of it too, it's the first point of almost no return. So once you've lodged your town planning documents and they're approved, you don't really want to go back and change them. And you really want to wait to the end of this process to realise that you can't build it for the cost you wanted to build it in the first place. So moving into the next section, it's developing um, the appointment of a, a project manager and or consultants, sorry, and consultants um, over and above the architect and a development of the design and tender documents. So it's really important to note here who negotiates the deal with the consultants and who is actually responsible for the design during construction. So what we find a lot of the time, the developer appoints consultants they have a negotiation, a scope, and a price determined, and they tell them how much they want to, um, how much design they want to develop, and then they get novated across to the builder after the tender process. And a lot of the time, there's a lot of discussion around that novation document. Is it really 80%? Have you got enough money in the kitty to finish the design? What other VM options we've identified? Is there redesign required? And all of this contractual stuff that, that Paul mentioned. Um, really, it's not just the head contractor with the developer and the, and the builder, it's also involved in 
the, the arrangement with the consultants. Yeah, and it becomes really messy for the consultants as well in this really difficult scenario because the design does shift during this process. Talk about the 80-20 rule or the 60-40 rule or whatever the percentages are and it really touches on what I said before. Is the design really 80% complete? Is there only really 20% to go? Um, and a lot of builders don't really delve into this detail and get bitten um, during that novation period after, or after the novation period during construction. And again, a builder can really add um, a lot of, can assist here as a consultant during the design to make sure it's getting, it's, build, you know, it's buildable. You know, are we thinking about access? Are we thinking about how big these panels are or whatever during that construction process or the design process? So then we move to the builder tender stage, this um, awesome stage for us as builders. Um, I want to talk about the tender matrix. This is something that um, uh, our managing director, Jason O'Hara, um, feels very passionately about. Um, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but it's really about how extremely wasteful and inefficient this process is, not just for the client, the developer and the project, but for the entire industry and how it's wasting so much time and money, which someone is actually paying for. Who, I'm not sure yet, but someone is paying for it. There's really minimal consultation with the project consultants. Value management, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail as well, is so critical, because as a builder, if you don't put VM options forward, you won't win the job. So you basically sit there with a red pen, try to find holes through the design and try to rape and pillage it to get the price down as low as you can or you won't be competitive. We also appoint other consultants to do risk and opportunity analysis with the intention if we win the job, we get rid of the current consultant and bring ours on. So that's not really efficient either. These guys do that for almost nothing with the intention of winning the job. And the builder's margin contingency and prelims are really, really critical here because if everyone prices it exactly the same and looks at it and, and interprets it and understands the job exactly how it should be interpreted, the only difference is margin, contingency and prelims. So if you want builders to start cutting on that, you know, that's when you start cutting on safety, you start looking at um, reducing margin and trying to screw your subbies and all of that sort of stuff and it really starts becoming a messy process. So let's look at this tender matrix. So a bit of math, it's not complicated. So it's um, pretty simple mathematics. Assuming there's four to five builders, um, there's generally about 28 to 32-ish trades. So when you talk about trade categories, it's demolition, it's, it's concrete, it's steel, it's render, it's paint, it's kitchens, it's carpet, it's landscaping, so on and so forth. And to get subby coverage, we develop a, a matrix where we look at, we want to get four to five subbies per trade. And depending on how many we get, we then increase our contingency. If we've only got one quote for every item, it's high risk. Because by the time you call the guy up to say, here's the contract, he goes, I'm busy, I can't do it. Okay, so it's a huge element of risk. So when you do the math on that, you do five times 30 times five, which is 750. So 750 people or organisations are involved in a particular project tender. And let's assume there's some overlap there. So some builders are calling the same concreter, some builders are calling the same tiler. Um, so let's cut it down to 500, let's say, okay? One, only one builder wins that job and only appoints 30 of subcontractors. So only 30 people win in this whole process. You divide that by 500, you're running at 6% success rate. This is extremely, extremely wasteful and costs a lot of money. And this is why when us as builders are tendering jobs and you've got this, these computer systems that just flood the whole market with drawings and ask everyone for tenders. Very few subbies actually spend a lot of time on it because they're getting called from this builder plus maybe two of the others plus every other tender out there. And they're just getting inundated with these stuff, the quote, and they're just trying to pump it out, just do rates, get it out there. They're not really looking for efficiencies during that process. Okay, and during that process too, they're only winning a very small percentage of it. So one, would you invest the time and effort into it, firstly, and two, it's costing them money. Every, all the subbies and supplies, it's huge estimating departments, just pumping work out. So someone has to pay for that. So it goes onto, the top, onto their bottom line, it goes to the cost of the product, so on and so forth. You can see this enormous mess of matrix happening here, which really costs a lot of time and money. So on top of that, we look at value management. And as I said before, it's a must. If we don't do it, we won't win a job. Um, 
other consultants carry out a lot of these risk assessments and the actual current consultants are not generally consulted during the tender process by the builder because we're very paranoid they're going to ring up the other builders and tell them. Got this great VM opportunity, we're going to reduce the slab by this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We don't tell anyone, we don't tell the project consultant because they might tell someone else we lose our competitive advantage. So I said the value management is really the only competitive advantage we have. So we don't tell the project consultant and we don't really have we factored everything in the current design that actually means we can apply this VM option? Because the best people to ask are the actual designers who are designed the building. Yep, so that makes sense. So there's not much collaboration during that process. And is it really value management? In four to six weeks, we're going to look at a job that's been designed 80% by all these consultants. And in four to six weeks, we kind of only really start getting our quotes back in the last week. And then we value manage it to come up with a figure. It's, it's not value management. I'll answer that question for you. Okay, getting to the last few points, tender review period and builder appointed and consultants novated. This is, uh, this is when it all comes home the roost for the consultants um, and the builder. The, what's, what's really interesting here in all my time um, being at Attilia, which is only 12 months, mind you, it's not a huge sample size, we have not come across a job after tender that has hit budget. I don't, I don't, I'd, I'd really challenge to see how many out there, and if they are, the developer will jump all over it because the builders probably missed something. Right? So that's the first feeling we get when we get a phone call from a developer. Yeah, you're, the, you're first in line. We're like, shit, what do we miss? <laughs> it's, it's really, that's what happens. Um, so it's generally over budget. So you don't, get, you don't get selected. You get nominated as the preferred builder. Okay? And then we put all the VM options in front. We meet, we meet all the consultants and we say, Here, this is what we've done to your design. Your facade's no longer that, it's FC sheet. We've done this, we've done that, just to try to get down the, and we're not even there yet. So let's get more VM options to try to get it down to the budget. And then the, then the consultants turn around to us and say, look, you can't actually do that because of this BCA requirement and the MFB have already authorised that and was in some fine print in the four million pages of tender documents we received that we didn't read. Um, and some of those VM options we can't actually implement. So we need more VM options on top of that. And through this whole process, we end up um, getting to a point where everyone's, you know, they're not, they're, it's not a win-win for everyone, let's say. And we negotiated, um, we're pot committed as builders, we want to get it across the line. So we negotiate, we get to a point, and then everyone gets innovated to us. And this, you actually start building it then. Yeah, so on top of that, with this VM options, you generally have a lot of redesigned. So we have to negotiate with the consultants to say you've only allowed 20%, all our VMs equal 50, so, but there's not enough money to pay you to do all those designs. So all this process becomes really messy and, and, and doesn't work really well. So if we were looking at that DNC process and said, where can a builder actually get involved? These are the mainly the three areas before we get the builder tender, where can she get involved as a consultant? Like, God forbid, pay a builder to be a consultant, you know, who'd want to do that? Um, but I generally believe that's an option that could be looked at. So look at a builder being a consultant, actually pay them a fee like all the other consultants and get them to actually give construction advice. The fundamental flaw with this proposal is that no builder's going to do that knowing it's going to go out the tender and all their IP and all their smarts is going to everyone else anyway. So if you are getting a builder involved through an ECI, which I call a token ECI that's going to build a tender, they're not going to give you everything anyway. They're going to keep a lot of it in their back pocket, trying to get an advantage so when the tender comes they go crunch, they know the design and try to beat everyone. Okay, so you're not really going to get that efficiency. Mm -hmm.